August 1945, the United States drops atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, in a last-ditch effort to stop the imperialist military dictators from killing more people. Soon, there is an arms race between America and the Soviet Union, with both sides trying to prove to the other that their weapons are more powerful. With mutually assured destruction between nations, rogue actors were of the highest concern to the leaders. Could a simple set of keys stop World War III? I'm Tim Coleman. I'm Tyler J. Thomas. And I'm Jeff Moss. Together, we will explore and discuss these events from the perspective of over 30 years of combined locksmith and door hardware experience. This is The Three Tumblers. Now, Deadliest Keys, Nukes at Sea. Nuclear fission is discovered in 1938 by German scientists as part of a Nazi research project. Soon after, the United States gains this knowledge and begins developing its own nuclear weapon under the name of the Manhattan Project. Led by Robert Oppenheimer, the thousands of scientists and technicians develop two different mechanisms of nuclear bombs. The enriched uranium weapon, Little Boy, and Fat Man, a plutonium implosion type device. After the Imperial Japanese regime ignored multiple warnings of prompt and utter destruction, a plan went into action. Under terms of the Quebec Agreement, Winston Churchill gave his consent to President Truman, who then ordered his military to drop the bombs on the prearranged targets. General of the Army Thomas T. Handy signed the written order to General Carl Spatz to drop the bombs. Eleven days later, the 509th Composite Group of the Army Air Force dropped the first bomb. Although the orders had been written and signed, there was nothing to stop the crew from accidentally or intentionally dropping the bombs off target. So it's interesting that there's all these different steps in between of, you know, giving orders and writing and instructing and until they finally do it. But then there aren't any there. It doesn't look like there's anything, like you said, to keep them from launching it somewhere else. So you got all these checks and balances leading up to it. But then the guys pushing the button can put it wherever they want. Yeah, I, I'm no military expert or historian or anything like that, but that sounds like uh, one of our other perfect storm type of situations where they try to, I wouldn't say cheap out necessarily because it was a major research project, but they missed that one little thing at the end that could go wrong. Around 1941 or 1942, a bunch of British scientists made an appeal to FDR that basically said, hey, the Nazis are developing an atomic weapons program and you need to start it on your end before it's too late. And so he did. And FDR appointed General Leslie Groves to basically get this done. The Groves picks three sites to assist with this project. Los Alamos, New Mexico, Hanford, Washington, and then he puts the garrison slash headquarters in this little town called Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And Oak Ridge is just outside of Knoxville. Now here's the fun story and why I mentioned all that. My best friend and mentor, Brett Camp, he grew up in Knoxville around this time. And lo and behold, his dad was an architect that helped design and build a lot of the buildings at the Oak Ridge site. The family even had an apartment within the exclusion zone. So I got to hear all these little neat stories about Breck, who was five, seven years old at the time when this all happened. Uh, had to show his pass anytime he entered or moved about town, uh, or how he used to go across the street and help with the switchboard operator to patch through calls. The neat part of his story is that Breck said at the time, he had absolutely no idea what the hell was going on. He knew it was military, but that was it. I mean, and that's how tight to the vest these people involved kept things with this project. His dad was involved in it, but Breck had no idea. He just thought, oh, we're here for military reasons, but I don't know what military reasons it may be. For all he knew, it could have been something to do with a TVA, which ultimately had something to do with why Oak Ridge was selected. You know, even the people that were involved, they weren't telling their wives, their, their sons or anything like that. So the U.S. military has 
several instances of losing atomic weapons. As outlandish as that may seem, one of those instances actually occurred off the coast of North Carolina, where an atomic weapon just simply fell out of the plane into the ocean. It was recovered eventually after years of searching, and it did not pose any type of threat, but to just have a weapon be able to fall off in any case, whether it's nuclear or not, that's not a good thing. The first main directorate of the Committee for State Security of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, more commonly known as the NKVD and later the KGB, had been running a network of spies within the United States since the 1930s, despite the two countries being wartime allies. Thanks to their agents, including Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the Soviets got a heads up on America's new superweapons. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin and his successor Nikita Khrushchev knew that to be considered a superpower, they must develop their own nuclear weapons. After widely publicized test detonations of nuclear weapons by both sides, the Americans launched the USS George Washington on June 9, 1959. She was the first operational submarine to both be powered by an atomic propulsion and carry nuclear ballistic missiles. The boat was led by Commander James B. Osborne of the Blue Crew and Commander John L. Frum, Jr. of the Gold Crew. On the 20th of July, 1960, Commander Osborne sent President Dwight Eisenhower a message reading, Polaris, from out of the deep to target, perfect. This was moments after the George Washington made history by launching a ballistic missile while remaining submerged. While the Soviets were quickly developing their own missile submarine, both sides recognized the need to prevent their captains from going rogue and starting the end of the world. Not even Khrushchev wanted anyone nuked out of existence. Both governments began working on a solution and involved weapon specialists, electrical engineers, and locksmiths to develop a way that the most devastating weapons in existence were not launched until the very second they were ordered to. The reason why the United States developed the USS George Washington was for several purposes. The first being nuclear propulsion at this time allowed submarine crews to operate at a distance and depth that had never been seen by the world before. During World War II and the years immediately after, diesel-powered subs were good, but they had to operate at periscope depth because the exhaust needed uh, snorkel mechanisms. You have to get fresh oxygen into the engine, and of course you have to vent the gas. Nuclear propulsion eliminated all of this. So a sub's range now was limited only by, basically, by the store of food that it kept on board. The other reason is because now you did not have to operate at just subsurface depths of you know, 20, 30, 40 feet, and you left absolutely no trace on the surface. So you could sneak up to your enemy and basically camp out there almost indefinitely until your food ran out. With that stealth, you could launch the nuclear missiles, which now can be launched from underwater, something else that had never been done by anybody in the world up until this point, and shower your target with nuclear warheads and never be detected, never be intercepted. That was that show of force, that might, by not being able to see us and us being able to see you, that put some real fear into the Soviets. Yep, so this is the old Soviet American espionage game. Spies really helped the Soviets really get rolling on their nuclear program. It, it wasn't just the Rosenbergs. You had Julius Fuchs, George Koval, Harry Gold. They all gave them a ton of nuclear information uh, and a lot of others. You know, this was the name of the game for decades between the two. You couldn't be outdone or outgunned. Or everyone in the world lived in constant fear that one slip up on either side would mean bad, bad things for everyone. Also, Nikita Khrushchev and Dwight Eisenhower 
they realize the destructive power of these weapons. And so now they're wanting to start to restrict how those weapons are launched. You don't want somebody, you don't want a madman behind wheel of a submarine who has the capability to just say fire at whatever. During the height of the Cold War, both U.S. and Soviet leaders recognized the threat of one of their own officers going rogue and launching nuclear missiles from their ship, triggering mutually assured destruction. Unlike the printed and signed orders given for the attacks on Japan during World War II, officials wanted to have more layers of security to ensure that no one man could arm or detonate a nuclear or strategic weapon. This fear of accidental mutually assured destruction led to the development of the two-man integrity rules. The first of these rules was that all persons aboard the ship in positions of command would be vetted so thoroughly that their kindergarten teachers were interviewed about their character. Mental, psychological, financial situations, political, religious ideologies, and personal relationships were all heavily scrutinized prior to the officer being offered command. In addition to everyday scrutiny of being in command of some of the country's largest and most powerful ships, they were also subject to regular psychological screenings. Once officers passed all of the promotion requirements, tests, and vetting, they were given command of the ship. Those given command of cruisers, SSBNs, or nuclear-powered, nuclear weapons capable ships were given even more attention. But even the most stalwart officers couldn't have direct, carte blanche access to nukes. Both the states and the Reds had extensive safeguards. So now I think we're talking about the controls and the safeguards and things like that that you would have. Uh, for example, like shutting off power or locking out pieces of machinery where multiple people have to be involved and things have to be locked or unlocked in a sequential order. So, you know, from a technical standpoint, this all seems like we're getting on the right track. Right, both sides are developing a system that has multiple layers of security and gives assurance to both sides, which is a very, very powerful political currency uh, that no one person can just wake up one day and say, Oh, I hate the Americans. I'm in charge of a nuclear submarine. I'm going to launch nukes on them today, or vice versa. And they still do it, even with non-nuclear stuff, things like security clearances or the interview processes for certain three-letter agencies. Ask me how I know. Mm -hmm. uh, the two-man integrity rule is a great one, but it can be accentuated when the people that are tasked with... Uh, evaluating and carrying out these sorts of orders are as even killed as they get. In 1959, a U.S. patent is issued for Eagle Log Company, with Frank J. Testa listed as the inventor. It was made for and sold to the United States government. Where and how it was used still remains a mystery. However, the lock cylinder contains some elemental designs that are still considered to be components of high security locks 65 years later. At first glance, the key is about the size of a modern day cabinet or desk drawer key. But on closer inspection, there is a channel cut into one side of the blade of the key. If you own a recent model Honda, Chevy, or some Ford model cars, you can look at your own key and have some idea of the channel often called laser keys, locksmith terminology for them is side milled. In addition to the side cut, the top of the key has four distinct points. These accommodate spring-loaded wafers that go up or down according to the cuts on the key. When all of the elements of the key and lock cylinder are aligned, the key turns smoothly. Since before World War I, Naval weapons have been manufactured to use electricity in their operations. Key cylinders that were integrated into electrical switches 
were invented very shortly after. It's logical to assume that strategic weapons launch controls were keyed electrical switches. However, the U.S. Navy can neither confirm nor deny any details. The reason we talk about this patent is that over the last few weeks, Tim and I have searched Google about nuclear launch keys enough that we're probably on a few government lists at this point. This is the only example that we were able to attach to an actual launch panel. Although there were a few circumstantial examples, but this was the only one we could definitively say, yeah, this is something that the U.S. government used. And I was able to find declassified pictures of launch panels using this cylinder. And lo and behold, if you go to the Minuteman Missile National Historic Site in South Dakota, and you take the tour, and after you're done with the tour, you go to the gift shop, you can purchase a set of replica launch keys, and I kid you not, one of these keys is on the set. So it's hilarious that they could have mocked up any key and just called them replicas and sold it like that. But no, they sold them replicas of what it was actually used. Uh, but back to the other keys, there were so many other varieties from like standard wafer locks to high security stuff to the same stuff that we use at prisons today. They weren't standardized for good reason. Uh, But there were so many different types of keys and designs that the American government used. Uh, The Russians, you can't find sort of any sort of corroborating information, details, whatnot. We found a few, but they were ultimately tied to satellite launch keys, which has nothing to do with what we're doing right now. So the Soviets were pretty tight-lipped and and kept what they had close to the vest. So we can only go by what the Americans had. They were using a high-security system Back then, it was even more high security than it is now. And uh, the Eagle Bell type of lock, somebody was actually asking me for some information recently. Uh, They were used on like some old gumball machines and things like that. And there's really no information. Eagle went out of business. The records are gone. Uh, There's no code books that I'm aware of. So even if you do have those keys, unless you're lucky enough to have a blank and a really old uh, machine, Uh, for Bell Sidewinder keys, uh, good luck. Yeah, these locks would be extremely difficult to pick, even today. Not impossible, but they would be difficult to pick. And the ideas that we see in these patents, which we will have links to in our show notes, they carry on to modern high security lock cylinders today. The idea of having multiple elements within inside the lock to keep it secure. Plus you have the keys that can't be easily duplicated. These are all just different things that come into play in modern day mechanical locks that uh, we consider to be high security. Now, the idea of having the electrical switches, um, we're going to get into it, but just suffice to say that between the three of us, Jeff, Tyler, and I, I think we could all three go into, you know, either Tyler's shop or Jeff's shop or my shop, spend about 20, 25 minutes rummaging around in the junk pile at the back and come out with a handful of parts. And we can actually make a key system, a lock that takes two completely separate keys. Uh, It's all mechanical, not electronic, because Jeff is the most electronically gifted of us but we could make a mechanical lock that operates on two, three, even five separate keys that all have to be turned at the same time in order to unlock it. The fact that they did this with electronic locks or electrical switching locks is really, really cool. USS New Jersey, 1982, Atlantic Ocean. Captain William M. Fogarty initiated general quarters while en route to Lebanon. As enlisted crew and lower-ranking officers rushed to their battle stations, the commanding officer, executive officer, and weapons officer initiated procedures of their own. An emergency action message had been received, and the CO and XO must now confirm that the order is real. Using keys that the captain and executive officer keep on their persons at all times, they go to one of the many safes installed on board. The safe they need has two openings for keys. Both men insert and turn their keys at the same time. 
Once the door swings open, they remove their assigned and sealed authenticators. These code books allow them to decrypt the EAM in separate areas and not helping each other, they both confirm and agree together that the message from the White House is a legitimate order to launch nuclear weapons. After agreeing the order is real, they go to another safe, this one installed on the ship by the National Security Agency. The combinations have been kept from the officers until now, having been set even before the safe was taken to the shipyard. Both the CO and XO dial in their assigned combinations, open the door, and retrieve the launch keys. They proceed to the missile launch control consoles on the bridge, and while looking at each other in a last confirmation, they insert the small brass keys into the locks of the arming switches. With a final confirmation, they turn the keys at the precise same time, and the ballistic missiles launch up and out, headed towards their target. At least, that's probably what would have happened if this had not been a drill. The official report from the United States Navy is that they can neither confirm nor deny that the New Jersey ever carried nuclear weapons. All right, so the USS New Jersey is actually a really cool warship of the United States Navy. She was first commissioned and launched in 1942 during World War II uh, and then retired at the end of the war. She was put back into service for the Korean War between 1950 and 1957, taken back out of service again, then put into service for the Vietnam War from 68 to 69, put back into the mothball fleet until 1982 when the tensions and military situation arose in Lebanon. Now, up until 1982, she received a number of upgrades, including Tomahawk cruise missile launchers. The Navy won't confirm or deny what ships or vessels have currently or have had in the past nuclear capable weapons, but suffice to say that certain ships that were equipped with it, when they received that emergency action message or EAM, they would be ready to strike. And I just have to say as a safe guy, it's really cool to see multiple safes on a ship. Uh, different combinations, dual custody, locks, uh, different safes for different things. It's pretty cool to me. Yeah, and you never hope to need to do this outside of drills, but, I mean, you got to drill on it because I know you, you never know when you may need it one day. Yeah, and it's good that they, they practiced, and I'm assuming that they practiced. I'm saying I hope that they practice this regularly, not just like once or, or anything. They probably can't confirm or deny that either, but it, it everybody's got to know what their role is and, and make sure that it's practiced well. So my friend and colleague and former co-worker is a retired commander from the Navy, and I got the chance to talk with him on the phone recently about some of this, doing research for this episode. To Jeff's point, what you just said was that the skipper of the boat could include these in the general quarters drills that happen quite often aboard a ship. And general quarters is basically everybody going to battle stations. And so the captain could include those officers who would be involved in the launch of strategic weapons to have them practice during these drills. Obviously, you don't have all members of the crew involved in the actual launch sequence, but you can at least have your senior staff involved in it. 90 miles off the coast of Florida in the early 1960s, a Soviet Project 641 submarine, known by its NATO designation as a Foxtrot class, B-59, was operating in international waters. Operating at depth, trying to hide from the Americans, it had no communications from Moscow for days. Captain Savitsky and political officer Semyonovich believed that the war had started between the two countries and wanted to launch the special weapon. 
However, Executive Officer and Chief of Staff Arkhipov did not agree. He had learned many lessons the year before with his involvement in the disastrous K-19 incident and convinced Captain Savitsky to surface the ship in Radio Moscow for orders when the batteries and oxygen started to run low. After surfacing, Arkhipov was somewhat relieved when American aircraft started firing alongside the sub instead of directly at it. This near disaster has been the only one ever told to the public. Because of this particular B-59's configuration requiring the agreement and cooperation of three officers, with one officer refusing to go along, nuclear war was narrowly avoided. To this day, neither the Russian nor United States governments will confirm these events. If you haven't figured it out by now, the previous story occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is probably the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear war. Kennedy and Khrushchev ultimately negotiated a way out for both sides, uh, but for 13 days, things like this were tense uh, and could have escalated to the point of no return because of one wrong interpretation or one wrong move. You know, I know it's fashionable then and now to paint the Soviets or Russians, whatever they're called now, as bloodthirsty communists hell-bent on world control at whatever cost, but there are a handful of great examples of the Soviets being rational, almost to a fault, to avoid nuclear war. Uh, another example is Stanislav Petrov, who was the command officer at a Soviet nuclear warning station in the early 1980s. One night, his new detection system starts registering that five missiles have been fired from the United States, and he needs to decide whether to move this information up the chain of command, which, you know, has a good possibility of a retaliatory strike, or he can just be rational about it. He's rational and rightfully concludes that if the Americans are going to launch an attack, uh, they're just not going to send five missiles. So he sits and he waits and he waits and he waits and nothing happens. And he was right. And for his efforts, he got denied promotions, he got reassigned, and was forced to take an earlier retirement. But the Soviets, begrudgingly, realized that their new early detection system has faults that must be addressed. But a lot of Soviets, and Americans for that matter, were rational during this period with regards to nuclear strikes or responses. And that plays a big hand in why we have yet to have a nuclear war. And God Almighty, I hope we never do. So the incident that we see in the waters off of Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis is the perfect example of having two-man integrity, three-man integrity in that case. And basically, you cannot turn the lights on without all three officers agreeing on it and literally inserting their keys and turning those keys at the exact same moment in complete serious agreement as to launch missiles. That's exactly what this entire system has been designed to do, is to keep people from panicking and saying, I really think we ought to launch right now. No, you have to agree. And because it takes three separate human elements to confirm the order, then we averted a rather nasty potential in history. Also, I want to note that radio communications between land and submarines has improved quite a lot since then. And it might not be real-time two-way communications just because of depths and salinity and water density and temperature and whatnot. But there is a way to get reliable messages to submerged submarines that are well over a thousand feet deep. Probably thanks to situations like this, because you don't want captains running on orders that are seven hours old or more. In 1976, the USSR laid down the largest submarine ever built. With 26 missile compartments, Project 941, or Akula, went into production. Better known by its NATO designation, the Typhoon class boasted submerged speeds of 25 miles per hour, pushing 48,000 tons of water out of the way. 
By 1984, however, author Tom Clancy had found out about the typhoon and made a fictionalized version of it, the main character in his novel, The Hunt for Red October. To man integrity is a key element to the plot, no pun intended. Other accounts of submarine and surface ship close calls have been depicted in movies and television countless times. However, neither the Americans nor the Russians have ever officially been so close as to have inserted the actual launch keys. So it seems like there, there's a lot of can't confirm or deny, don't know if any of this ever actually happened, hasn't happened, thankfully won't happen. Uh, so it's tough to know a lot about this for me personally because I'm not a military history kind of guy. So we can all just continue and keep hoping that none of this stuff ever has to be used. That's kind of how I feel. So even during the height of the Cold War, there was actually a direct line of communication established between the White House and the Kremlin. And it basically allowed for another form of two-man integrity to exist, where you had the leader of the United States and the leader of the Soviet Union able to communicate at least mostly directly to say, hey, is this for real? Are you for real? Did you have your guys put their launch keys into the switches and turn them? And the other side could say, yes, that way we would know this was real. But it is so amazing. All these different layers of safety and security and authentication come down physically to just two keys that are made out of brass. That the three of us cut every day. We can probably take apart one of these locks. If we were to get one in our hand, we could take it apart and examine all of the elements. Now, I don't think the three of us will ever be able to get our hands on a declassified, decommissioned nuclear launch switch lock until we are well in our 60s. I think that we could take those elements down and recognize so many elements out of those logs from back then that were in service protecting this world, this country, and recognize how the elements didn't hit the commercial market until maybe 10 years later. So it's really cool to see all that. Nineteen eighty six. President Ronald Reagan said, Peace does not exist of its own will. It depends on us, on our courage, to build it and guard it and pass it on to future generations. To be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. Reagan waged peace through his strategic defense initiative that scared Soviet leader Yuri Andropov so much he bankrupted the USSR. Several years later under Gorbachev, the Berlin Wall came down, and so did the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Although the media might portray tensions as being increased with Russia and other nuclear dictatorships, those countries have been at the strategic weapons table long enough. All have keys to keep their ship captains cool. The fear to have today is countries that develop nuclear weapons and decide to skip the keys altogether. Executive producer is Tyler J. Thomas. Technical producer is Jeff Moss. Writer and editor is Tim Coleman. For source material, see our website, 3 Get this episode and others wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Three Tumblers production. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.